the positive cash flow was the aha moment was even though the cash flow is important, what makes you truly wealthy is this is what I call a balance sheet bill, turning 600 into 1.2, turning 1.2 into 2.2 or whatever the numbers are. And if you're getting something smaller, it's turning your 10 grand into 20 grand, your 20 grand into 50 grand and you get it started. This is Property Invest Story where we talk to successful property investors, find out more about their stories, mindset and strategy. I'm Taran Shum and in this episode on Property Invest Story, we're speaking to owner of Bradley Property Group, Dave Bradley. We'll follow the property developer through his natural progression from accounting to property investing and development. He how he was forced to deleverage during the GFC and how he turned $640,000 into $1.2 million within 18 months. Also, before we delve into this episode, go over to propertyinveststory.com and subscribe to receive your free property investor case studies where you'll learn how to generate passive income from your properties. Go there now to sign up for free. So, you might be wondering, who's Dave Bradley and what does he do in any given day? You know, I, when I saw about my title, when I fly overseas, I still write chartered accountants in the uh, in the little occupation box that it's there. So, I'm still a member of the chartered accountants even though I don't practice it. Uh, what I, I stopped doing that about 10 years ago. I guess right now, I uh, what people would call a full-time property developer. I've got a particular stout with council, so I, I seem like I fight organisations and I fight bureaucratic processes. It feels like I do it right now. Typically, what I do is I develop properties, and what I say with that is I uh, I will take a, a piece of property, I will try and add value to it by creating more dwellings, and then typically selling off the dwellings. And uh, all going well, that process will create a surplus, which as you know is profit, which... Uh, Put tea on the table uh, for my, my family and for investors and people that I work with. Uh, on a, I guess, a more holistic level, what I what I what I do is I, I run a business and I run money and I, uh, I I create wealth for myself, and my investors, and I do that using property as a vehicle and and as a I guess as a means uh, to doing that. So a lot of the stuff that I do is more using. Uh, I try to use my management skills and my business skills rather than my trading skills, which uh, not that good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, it's interesting that you say that because a lot of us say we get on the tools, and when I, when they say get on the tools, it actually just means using their brain. <laughs> I'm thinking, or I calculate rate per square meter, or you know, <laughs> selling prices, or GST margins, or whatever. That's the same. You know, my tool is right as a calculator, which, and I'm lucky that in, in a sense, uh, being an accountant, I'm pretty good with numbers, and so the calculator. In, a lot of times it's in my brain. So uh, I do have one on my desk just in case of emergency. You know. Due to his aptitude for trading, he says his property investing skills are terrible. So I reckon I'm a terrible property investor because I don't actually keep anything. I, buy, so I sell everything. I'm a, I'm a trader, not, a, not an investor. So uh, I reckon I'm terrible at that. <laughs> Despite not currently holding any investment properties of his own, Building a portfolio of developments with Steve McKnight in the past has aided him in his success. I think you know it's probably important to go back as to why that was the case. And so, you know, when Steve and I were getting started, and we were, and I'm sure you people have heard the story. I'm sure you can tell the story of you know we would buy stuff for positive cash flow, and so you know go and buy property, and it would you know we'd put down some money, we'd sign for a loan, and it would create a passive income or a positive cash flow uh, result. The problem was is that was you know uh, it was really really boring in a lot of ways. It was really succe- really really successful and really really boring. And so we got to the point and you went, well, what am I supposed to do now? And so I think mean, quite rightly you might say, you know, well, we got to the situation of our positive cash flow was you know quite a significant number. But then there's a question of and then what? And then what do you do? And so you know I'll give you rough numbers. If you if you owned a property that you paid a hundred thousand dollars for and it's spinning off a thousand dollars a month, a week, a year, whatever, it doesn't really matter. What do you do when the property's worth two hundred thousand dollars or three hundred thousand dollars, and you start going? And, not, and what I created myself, or, or the knowledge of, I suppose, or the thought process of, was, well, 
why don't I sell that property for two hundred thousand and I'll get and I'll invest two hundred thousand, I'll go and do it again and again and again. And so no, I started talking about the velocity of money and uh, you know, trying to turn a buck into two bucks and two bucks into four bucks and you know, and so on and so on and so forth. And I'm still doing the same thing right now. It's just uh, the bigger numbers and a bit different strategies and so forth. But that's the game that I'm trying to play. Is exactly the game I was playing you know, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, whenever I was you know, doing stuff with Steve and the proper positive cash flow days. So right now, you know, I'm busily in trading mode as opposed to in hold mode. Now I'm also uh, 20 years older than what I used to be as well. So I've also got one eye on the future, saying, "Well, at a point in time, you're not going to keep doing that." So you're going to actually, you know, you're going to hold some stuff. And so I'm about to come to the, you know, the, the round the board where not only will I develop stuff, but I'll actually keep some of the stuff that I develop, whatever that thing is, whether it be a group of shops or it's a group of houses or what have you, where you actually keep it and, and hold it for the rental stream. So, uh, but I haven't done that yet. That's that's like, you know, next week's game or next year's game or something like that. So the, the current round the board before I collect my two hundred dollars and you know go in again is is trading. Uh, the next one will be uh, all right. You've traded enough. Now you need to retain some of this stuff. Bradley shares a little bit about where he grew up before moving to Australia. So I was eleven. We came out uh, came out from the northwest of England in search of uh, a better life. Essentially, I, I I was growing up, and my parents were going through what I think was known as Thatcher's Britain. And the northwest of England there was a, a lot of factories and mills, and they were all shutting. And the youth unemployment rate was something like you know forty or fifty percent. So my parents uh, sought out to immigrate to Australia as a way of uh, getting a better life. In discovering who he was as a person, he set himself the goal to become a chartered accountant. First, we moved to Sydney, and then a few years later, we moved to Melbourne. So I have very, uh, I have very mixed uh, memories of, of growing up. I don't necessarily have you know, friends from uh, you know you went to prep with and this sort of stuff because that wasn't my wasn't my experience. What it did do is it, uh, it put a couple of virtues uh, that got instilled in me from from a young age. The, fir- the first one was. Uh, that, that I spent a lot of time by myself because coming out from England and not having not, not having any family here and uh, you know getting, getting my friends, I spent a lot of time just just me. So I became very uh, comfortable with who I was. So I became very comfortable with what I did, and I learned from very young age that I didn't really care what other people thought of me because it was just it was just it was just me. The other thing that got instilled in me from a young age is I remember my parents not say fighting about money, but I heard them complaining about money. And so I never had money uh, there. We never went without or anything like that. But I never, my parents sacrificed a great deal and we never had money. And I remember saying uh, to myself, probably about 13, 14, I'm not going to do that. I remember one particular day, my mum, I don't know, came out of my bedroom or lounge room, wherever I was, and uh, she said, I'm going to take $50 from the bank card to pay off the Visa card. That was that was their financial plan or their financial strategies at the time was just, just to stay alive. And I went, I'm not doing this. So I had a friend at school, and his dad was an accountant. And I asked what an accountant did, and, the, and, I, and the accountants were, were the people who were, you know, greased the wheels of, of behind all big businesses was accountants. And I thought that accountants made lots and lots of money. So at that point in time, I said, well, I'm going to be an accountant then. That was as simple as that. I thought accountants equal lots of money, so then I'll do I'll do that. So I went through, I uh, you know, finished my schooling, and I actually went to st- start my degree, uh, my accounting degree, and I ended up. Long story very short, I ended up doing it at night school and working in a chartered accounting office. I was really, really fortunate that the chartered accounting office had lots and lots of lots and lots of clients, of which a lot of them were super wealthy. And the common goal amongst, or the common uh, trait amongst all of them, was that they all owned uh, investment properties. And I came to the conclusion. I went, hmm, maybe there's something in this. <laughs> that you know, the thing about being rich is necessarily being an accountant, but they all seem to have one thing, and that's property. From there, he began learning more about property. And then I had to, very lucky that I had a mentor uh, as a client from, the, from about 17 years old who encouraged me to do things, albeit that fell on deaf ears for a long period of time. But eventually, after I stopped doing accounting, I used to catch up with him and uh, you know, we'd uh, talk about what had happened and why it happened and so forth. And one of the things he attributed as a factor of success was uh, being a migrant. You come back and you have a and the thing about being a migrant is being a, a having a migrant mentality and so you know, people come to Australia because it's a lucky country so you have to succeed and so I, I still have that even today going my parents sacrificed a great deal for me to be here that 
you know, the Australia is built on a whole bunch of migrants, and there's a mentality that they have because they they come here to get things done. And so, I guess, you know, my growing up, maybe not different to maybe a lot of people or most people, but it certainly instilled a lot of values and a lot of experiences that I draw upon, you know, to this very day. Although there was no influence from his parents in terms of property, Bradley gained insight from his mentors and peers throughout his career. Very lucky I had a client who was a, who was a, you know, a, a big time uh, was a property guy and uh, you know he passed away about eight or nine years ago and I, I, I would catch up with him, uh, I'll say regularly, not as regularly as I would like, especially now he's not, no longer with us. But just you know, talk stuff, and, and as I used to say to him, there's a, there'd be a lot of people you'd have had the chat to because you know he took me for lunch one day, and we had the chat about you know basically I, I liken the thing. He was my rich dad if you go back to a, a rich dad poor dad scenario. So I, at the time, though, I didn't realise it. It wasn't until later on that I realised it, and so uh, and I was really fortunate that I you know I had a few like I say sliding door moments where I went okay. <laughs> I, I now look back on and go they were fairly instrumental in informing. Uh, my outlooks on various things and even now when I deal with certain situations I'll still go you know this guy was on his Murray what would Murray do and uh, that, you know, I, uh, I can still see Murray's son uh, you know as we, we catch up every, every so often and uh, have lunch and, and talk about what we're both up to and so forth but I still talk about you know, what, what would Murray do and that's what I would do you know every time I see his son I, you know I say your, your father was an amazing man not only for what he did but you know the way he reached out and you know it, it's I wouldn't be anywhere near where I am right now without your father being having you know cross paths in, in their lives. Coming up after the break, we'll delve into Bradley's property journey on how he branched out into his own accounting business with Steve McKnight. So Steve and I were the two managers, and uh, you know, we, we were basically, I think, you know, we were on site, we were being pitted against each other as who was going to be the next partner. Except we both spoke to each other and we were friends. We actually don't want to be partners in this place. We reckon we can do it better. How he got started in property? Well, I was buying properties to rent. It was that simple. And then along the way, uh, one of these properties needed renovating. So we renovated it and we learned how to renovate. One of his worst property investing moments when the GFC hit? This same major bank used to run an ad after the GFC that said, uh, "What did they say? We were, uh, during the GFC, we were the we were the first bank to really support people." I went, "Really? Man, you guys are, you guys were leading the charge, running for the hills." Was my it was my experience. And that's next. I'm Tyrone Shum, and you're listening to Property Invest Story. Hey, podcast listeners, are you enjoying listening to these stories and want more? Then head over to propertyinvestory.com and subscribe to receive your free property case studies that I only send exclusively via email. Just one of the many benefits of being part of this community. These real case studies are from experienced property investors where they share specific numbers of their portfolio, their strategies and much more. Simply visit propertyinvestory.com to get your free case studies. Now back to the show. As ambitious accountants, Bradley and Steve McKnight were working in the same firm when competition arose between the pair. So I was, you know, working in the working in the accounting firm, and I moved to accounting firms as, as you do. Uh, I, I ended up working in the firm, which is where I met Steve. Uh, so Steve and I were the two managers, and uh, you know, we, we were basically, I, th- I think, you know, they were on site. We were being pitted against each other as who was going to be the next partner. Except we both spoke to each other and we both went, we actually don't want to be partners in this place. We reckon we can do it better, which is, you know, fairly typical of people at that age. I reckon they can do things better than everybody else. So, you know, what, what do you do? You go and put your name on the door and you put your own accounting practice name on the door. So Bradley McKnight Accounting Practice was formed. Uh, and off, off it went into business. Uh, a short time thereafter, you know, Steve came to me and he said, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I went, well, what do you want to do, mate? And so you know, the real estate business, uh, started off in very, very humble beginnings and around the same time we'd been to a uh, Robert Kiyosaki seminar and we'd sort of uh, listened to the virtues of po- positive cash flow and, you know, we started buying some houses in, uh, in Ballarat and, and, and so it went on. I'm sure people have uh, heard the stories and, and, and off it went. Uh, people at the time and, and later on have said, oh, well, anyone could have done that and you're absolutely spot on anyone could have done that. But not many people did do that. So there was something that's clearly, which was 
which was stopping people, which is more than just a physicality. So it's interesting as you come back and talk about stuff because people always look to put an obstacle in front of their way. Oh, it's because you're an accountant that you were successful. It's because you're in the right place. It's because you invested in, you know, back in 1999, you did that. It's because, it's because of this. It's, it's never anything. It's, it's because of them. It's always something else that is, that is the case. And I think that's one of the probably the biggest things that uh, stops people from doing it. On beginning their own accounting business, they had no idea how it would take off. So you know, we started our own accounting practice. We, we, you know, we for a number of years. We, we uh, the business model was we do an accounting fees, and uh, I would make it in, in, in accounting fees. Steve would go and invest it, and before we knew it, we uh, people wanted to hear our story because we had quite a bit of success doing some things with various investments. And so I think around the same time, you know, PropertyVC.com the website was born, and essentially it was a business where people could know the more. The more uh, investing we did, the more people wanted to hear about what we did, the more people wanted to hear, the more money we had, which meant the more investments we had, and this thing just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And, you know, I remember the, some of the things we did, I, you know, even now would pinch myself going, there's no way that should have happened. And, you know, writing books, which is where Steve wrote the book, you know, which uh, was the number one best selling business book and whatever it's, you know, it, it was tremendously successful and a tremendously rewarding period of time. And you go, we were just two accountants who, you know, had a bit of a, bit of a crack. Is, uh, is is my take. So you know, on on and on it went, and it got to the point of you know you you, you achieve what is known as financial freedom or financial uh, certainty or you know passive income goals or whatever it is that you get to. And uh, you know, Steve and I got to a point one day and said, you know, it's it's probably time. <laughs> you know, we both need to go our own separate ways. And you know, we're nice to see still see still see Steve now, and you know, good friends and all the rest of the stuff. It was just that we the business part of our relationship had, had come to a, a a natural uh, parting, if you like, and that's you know. And we still, you know, we have a foundation together, and there's all the things that we're, we're joined with, and I you know, see them. And it's it's you know, it's a, it's a really positive thing that, that that happened. So through the business part of that, you know, we started off as a very simple thing, just buying stuff to increase our, pass, our passive income. That was how we started. Along the way, we learned things. So you learn about velocity of money, you learn about leverage, you learn about skill set, and you learn about different markets and how things change. Entering into property development occurred organically for Braley as he shifted away from simple renovations and towards building. Well, I was buying properties to rent. It was that simple. And then along the way, uh, one of these properties needed renovating. So we renovated it and we learned how to renovate. So our second property we ever did was was, uh, was a house that Steve and I renovated with Steve's dad. And I can't remember what the budgeted profit was, but it, the actual profit was nowhere near that. <laughs> You know, so there's a lot of these renovation shows where they show you know some guy putting a lick of paint on and making a bazillion dollars. That, that that wasn't my experience. And so you know, you go from renovating, and you went, I don't like that. So our second renovation project was a group of flats where we, we the, the the best thing we did was get a project manager in to do the actual renovation. We we I in this case became the the manager of the manager, which is what I do particularly well. And at a point in time, the house couldn't need renovating. It had a backyard, so we, uh, you know, we cut off the backyard. And so, you know, and I, I forget the time frames because around this time I started, I went off by myself, but he started cutting off backyards. And I started buying backyards. Then I started building backyards. Then I started buying properties that could be developed into two townhouses, into three townhouses, into, and, and it, it grew and grew and grew. And that's what I'm doing right now is just, so I start off a developing business by buying a rental, by buying rental properties, and it grew and grew from there. And the only change I would encourage people to have is this, is this notion of just say yes. So uh, I bought my first apartment development off a conversation for a guy from a real estate agent who said, "Do you do apartment sites, Dave?" And I went, "Yeah, why not?" <laughs> I knew nothing about apartment sites, but I did an apartment site. And I figured I would learn on the job, which is what I did. I made whatever much money I made out of, the, out of the project, but I learned a whole bunch of stuff along the way. So a lot of this notion of just say yes, or you know, you're never too old to learn, or you know, the, 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 the market changes if you like. And so, what are you doing to change with the market? And so I learned a lot of stuff. I, when people I speak to colleagues now, or, or people who ring me up, or what have you, it's you know, what are you doing to stay in touch with the market? And I mean, right now, today's date is you know, it's whatever it is in 2017 that you know, the market is a certain way. The market was different three months ago, and therefore, by the judgment, the market will be different in three months' time. How are you going to change with the market? And whether that's the actual construction market, whether it's the finance market, whether it's the buyers in the market, whether it's 
uh, overseas influences, there's something that's always changing, which is influencing things. Are you changing with it? And so if you're still, if you're still doing what you were doing five years ago and you're expecting it to you know, come back in vogue, you know, don't be surprised if it doesn't. The worst investing moment for Bradley came when he was halfway through developing a property at a time when the market was volatile. The worst moment was uh, post GFC uh, that, was, that was in that. And uh, I had two projects which were funded via one of the big four banks, and straight off the bat, the bank said to me, We are not funding your project. I'd already signed a, I'd already signed a building contract. Well, they, sorry, they didn't say we're not funding you, we said we're, we're changing how we are funding you. And, and so uh, I had. Uh, in a space of you know one afternoon or one morning, whatever the phone calls have gone, because I'd already signed a building. I said had the contracts work. I'd signed a building contract with builder, and I'd signed a finance contract with the lender. So my banker, more my builder, has, it doesn't really care where the money's coming from, as long as the money's coming from. So what that meant for my cash flow is it was about a million and a half dollar shortfall in my cash flow. So in the next sixty days, I had to realise you know a seven figure sum of money. Uh, which, you know, you go, right, that's nice. And so you know, this this same major bank used to run an ad after the GFC that said, uh, what did they say? We were, uh, during the GFC, we were the, we were the first bank to really support people. And I went, really? Man, you, guys are, you guys were leading the charge running for the hills. Is my, it was my experience, but it's there. And so that was, you know, one story. The second probably one was when uh, – I essentially got a call from the banks that says you have too much money out the door. We want you to uh, we want you to deleverage. And they said, uh, and I can't remember what the number was. I think I had about uh, twenty million dollars out the door with them. And they said we want you to be ten million dollars in ninety days' time. What? <laughs> How can they do that? <laughs> Absolutely. So you're talking. So you asked me. The, I think your question was, what was your worst moment? The worst moment is because you come back and so I, I was in partnership with the guy at the time and he was absolutely livid wanted to you know <laughs> go down there and do all sorts of unspeakable things and I went no no, no it's, 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 there's lessons in this and now at the time I also wanted to do unspeakable things I'm not going to lie but you go hang on that's not going to get me anywhere so what do I need to do his next step was to deleverage asking the bank to give him seven days to pull it all together seven days I had valuations done in my complete portfolio and I had a strategy of how I was going to I was going to decrease my debt I sent it to them, I, so I, I sent them a, do, a document that would have been, I don't know, 60 pages long. So a, a real estate agent's valuation, backed up by comparable sales, and, and my plan of how I was going to do this. Now, for the purposes of explaining something, if you've got a property that's half finished, it's really hard to sell a half finished property. So you need to finish the property and then sell it. Like, so you can't just sell something. So there was a plan that was done that. If you've got a property that's got a tenancy there for another three months, you know, and, and you know it's an owner-occupied type property, there's no point trying to sell it now. You need to wait three months and sell it as a vacant property. So that was all part of the things that I, I was doing. So what did I do? I, I, sent, I sent this document out and a week later, I rang up the bank and I said, I was just checking you got my documents. Uh, yes, I have, but I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Excuse me, hang on, a week ago, you, 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 you were about to pull the rug from underneath me and now you haven't even had the courtesy to, to, to actually read my proposal. So I, I paused and I went, what does all this mean? They say, this is why the market changes. So everyone gets given the same amount of facts. Everyone gets reads the same stories, case of how you interpret it. So this guy had clearly, from the bank, been given a directive to reduce le- reduce lending for whatever reason being the case, uh, whether it was they were scared about their exposure or whatever whatever would have happened. I think by me, as a, this is the accounting background, attacking the problem and going, there you go, this is my, so I, I, I see you with a problem, I can see why you see the problem, and he said, I'm going to solve the problem. I think they went as a, as, a, as a bank, whether they thought this directly or just by default, went, well, this guy's a good custodian of money, therefore we're going to leave him alone. We're going to focus our attention on the guys who sent the letters to who haven't actually responded yet. They're the ones we're going to, we're going to, we're going to put our efforts into. From this incident, Bradley had learned a valuable lesson that not everything will go according to plan. It's my problem to solve and I'll solve the problem. And so, you know, you, you, it's, 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 there's a few character traits that you learn throughout where you go, no, no, we'll be okay. I just need to solve. There's, there's a problem here. I just need to work out how to solve this problem. And so when people say, oh, yeah, you were lucky, Dave, I go, no, you, you, you don't know what this sort of person does or when you've, you know, you're in this, this, uh, 
in a certain predicaments where you go, I have to solve, I have to solve this. And so there are plenty of times that I, you know, I could, I could spend the next hour talking about, you know, the problems that I've had in business with where things haven't gone to plan and and what you do. I think suffice to say is that when I do, whenever I do a, a development deal now, one of the things I say to myself and to various investors who, who I partner with, I say, there's only a couple of guarantees in this project, and the first guarantee is it won't go to plan. There will be a problem. Uh, well, I, what, the, what, what the good news is that I will fo- I'll work out what the problem is and I'll work out the solution to the problem. <laughs> but if you go into a development or anything in life for a matter of thinking you're going to have the best case scenario, well, you can't be that surprised if something goes wrong. You've got to have some contingencies and some plan Bs and some what ifs if this happens. And that might, one of the things I see commonly is you know, people believing the best case scenarios, believing what people say or believing what they want to believe rather than, hang on, what happens if it doesn't go to plan like this? What are you? What are what are you going to do next? And that's probably what I've learned. As with most of our guest stories, there was a shining moment where everything clicked for him. This was when he realised the power of cash flow. I was going down this road of, of, uh, of passive income and positive cash flow, and I remember I bought uh, I bought something like. Three blocks of flat. I remember, I remember. I actually remember it really well. It was it was November two thousand and one because I missed my daughter's birth because I bought these flats. It was a different story. So I remember it really clearly. You know, I've still got that story up my sleeve for the twenty first as well. So I'd, I'd paid. I'd, I'd bought these three blocks of flats. They're actually in Tasmania, and you know, for people who numbers wise, I, I paid six hundred and forty grand for these three blocks of flats, and the, the, the rentals per year were about. They were just under a hundred thousand dollars, and I. I went, wow, what's, what, you know, this is a great result and, you know, so on. The, the, the positive cash flow of all the expenses is about 30 grand a year. So uh, Steve was happy because we were making 30 grand a year. You know, the, the people in Seminole Land were happy because it was a great story and it was a nice feel good feel. And I sat there and I went, and I remember having a, a, a blue, a Barney with Steve one day and I said, this stuff's worth, I said, we should sell this stuff. And he said, no, we shouldn't. We should keep it as positive cash flow and blah, blah, all, all this sort of stuff. As you imagine the stuff. And my aha moment was I took it to market and I sold it. And I sold it for just a little bit under $1.2 million. So I turned 640 grand. I'll ignore the purchase cost and selling cost for the purchase example. We were there. 640 grand into $1.2 million uh, in about an 18 month period. And so the positive cash flow was whatever that is. And the aha moment was is the, even though the cash flow is important, what makes you truly wealthy is this. Uh, is what I call a balance sheet bill, turning 600 into 1.2, <laughs> turning 1.2 into 2.2 or whatever the numbers are. And if you're getting something smaller, it's turning your 10 grand into 20 grand, your 20 grand into 50 grand and, and getting started. So you need cash flow. And so a lot of people approach cash flow and cash flow is really, really important because that's what keeps you survival. My aha moment was what will, what will make me accelerate this quicker is if my net worth, my balance sheet, my books, whatever, if I can grow that at an a accelerated rate, that is what will win me the game, if you like. And so all I'm doing right now is trying to do exactly the same thing. So you know, the last property that I purchased for you know, whatever money I purchased it for, it, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it going, uh, how much capital am I investing and how much can I turn it into as quick as I possibly can? That's what the, that's what the game is. Another important thing which Bradley realised was about timing in the property market. There is never a perfect time. The perfect, the, 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 so, in, in a sense, right now, I, you know, I'll go to go for a run with a few buddies, and they'll say, "Oh, it's a great time to be in the property market. It's it's an all time high. I mean, you must be really happy." I go, "Yeah, it's terrific. When I'm selling, it's not that good to buy though, because you know it's there, or or it's not that good to refi- or to finance stuff because you know I might pay a million dollars for something, but." The bank goes to value it. They go, oh, so we reckon it's only worth nine hundred. So I'm going to give you money based on nine hundred. What do you pay a million for? And go, you read it's a hot market. I have to pay a million. So then go, oh, well, you want the market to drop then? And I go, yeah. I just think I'm going to go get and find this if the market drops. When the bank goes, oh, we don't give anyone any money. We'll call the money in, or uh, you know, there's your stuff you're trying to sell. You know, so there's there's no such thing as a perfect market. There's there's only a few number of a few number of combinations and a few variables in, in there, and then they never they are never all in your favour. There's always something that is problematic that you need to solve, and that's the reason why a lot of people sit on the sidelines and don't get in and, and justify it by waiting for it to be completely perfect. And that's the reason why it's easy to transact or easier to transact because yeah, people want to do it. 
but there's something that stops him from doing it. And I think that's something he's wanting to believe that wanting, wanting to believe that everything is perfect before he can enter the market. So, inspired by Bradley's journey and his amazing aha moments, we'll keep the conversation going in a future episode on Property Invest Story, where we'll talk about how to apply his strategy. Now, right now, I'm doing a lot of construction of townhouses, and I'm also doing some land uh, subdivision. They're the strategies that I'm using right now. Unpack his advice on becoming a successful property developer. When you start doing multiple, the biggest thing that, that you need to understand is cash and cash flow and how the cash flows. And that's next time in a future episode of Property Invest Story. Also, if you haven't subscribed to receive your free property case studies that I only send exclusively via email, you can text me your email address to 0499881040 to subscribe. These real case studies are from experienced property investors where they share specific numbers of their portfolio, the strategies and much more. Simply text me your email address to 0499881040 to get your free case studies. Thanks for listening.